we need to move on to the biggest story of the day, which is, well, pretty much the same thing, really. Uh, broken politics, things not working the way they should. Now, Rishi is making a big speech at the Tory party conference today. This is supposed to be, Darren, his reset. This was going to be how uh, Rishi is going to take the party into the next general election, is going to G up all the activists and go, yes, we're going to set the tone, we're going to win, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to have a big message and a big policy sell for you. But the leaks seem to have done for it. So we've heard over and over again that HS2 to Manchester is being axed. He has refused to speculate on it over and over again. And it seems very, very likely now, in fact, so likely you could probably bet your house on it, that he is going to announce in the speech that it is not going to happen. And he's somehow going to say that well, that will uh, enable them to afford to pay for other things. But, you know, you don't get Northern Powerhouse Rail unless you spend money on HS2. And if you don't do HS2, then you have to spend more money on Northern Powerhouse Rail, which then, of course, makes it uneconomic. So why are people going to do it? Uh, and the Mirror here is reporting that he's going to criticise 30 years of political failure, which is a bold move from uh, the sixth Tory prime minister in that period. Um, but he seems intent probably on blaming Tony Blair as opposed to uh, John Major, David Cameron, Theresa May, Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, or himself. We've had two Labour PMs in 30 years and six Conservative Prime Ministers. Uh, the Labour ones presided over stable administrations. The Tory Prime Ministers, each and every one of them, had some kind of administration that was a loose coalition of chaos and factionalism and infighting and absolute nightmare. Um, but what do you think, Darren? Do you, do you think if if this uh you know the briefing is right that he's going to be criticizing 30 years of political failure that that he's got a point i mean if we get to the point where we have a veterans minister who's not veterining <laughs> is he actually telling the truth do you know um rishi sunak uh, is symptomatic of a government that has nothing nothing for us if you look at that spread we showed a second ago it shows you that every area of public life is in ashes. And the headline is so, it sums up the situation so well. Extremity yesterday and throughout the Tory party uh, conference and confusion. The one thing none of us are confused about is the fact that this government is full of mendacious, lying, I've obviously got to be careful with, with one, one or two of my words. Um, <laughs> uh, I, trust me, I want to go a lot further, but I think blaming other people is all Rishi Sunak has. He's done a round of interviews at the weekend where he's been asked straight up about HS2 and he's obfuscated and he's tried to misdirect and he's tried to answer separate questions rather than actually telling the truth about mm. the situation. And uh, listen, we will always do that. Our front page uh, 13, it, it, just a number 13, sums up the number of years that it has taken this Tory government to tear this country apart. And instead of actually owning those failures, it tries to get us to attack each other. Now, I'll get to um, that in a second, all of the divisiveness. But I think as far as you're concerned, you're right. You, you, you summed up all of the numbers all of the ministers who have been in charge, all of the individuals uh, within the Tory uh, government who could have done something about the problems they're claiming the country now has and they're trying to shift to the door of the opposition. It's embarrassing. And the thing that frustrates me the most is that there, there are lots of politicians popping up on TV shows trying to defend records that are indefensible and trying to blame, for example, doctors for going on strike to, to get better pay so they can recruit more people within their cohort to be able to help people. And yet they are trying to blame those doctors for be, and nurses for being selfish and trying to claim and use emotive language to turn ordinary people against the people who want a better service for them. You look at education, you look at the service industry, you look at every area of public life has been raised to the ground by this government. And now Rishi Sunak is going to do the equivalent today. You talk about resets, he's going to unplug it and plug it back in again. 
come on, do me a favor. Right, every, yeah. every, everyone has their number by now and trying to get everyone to turn against each other and trying to get people to believe that it was the fault of a party that was last in power 13 years ago. Try and pull another one. Mm, yeah, well, we'll have to see, won't we, how that speech is going to go down. Now, interestingly, um, Kevin was saying uh, earlier in week on Monday that the, where the Tories give their big speeches now is no longer in the big conference hall. They've shut that down because they can't fill it. And they've repurposed a press area on the side of the room, which you can just about fit a few hundred people in. And that is where he's, they're now giving their conference speeches. And even earlier in the week, you know, Grant Shapps still managed to make it look empty. Uh, but, you know, Grant Shapps is another one who's not talking to nuclear veterans. So he's not on my Christmas card list. Now, what do you think, everybody? Do you think the political system is broken? Do you think she's got a point? Do you think that there is, um, it's unfair for us to say uh, in the mirror that um, there's 13 years and they should have fixed it if there's a problem. Marco says politics isn't broken, the Tories are broken. There's a lot of people in the Conservative Party who currently agree with you, including the poor chap who was thrown out for um, quietly mentioning Suella Bravman was talking rubbish. It wasn't even a heckle. Uh, Denise says, I want an election, get him out. Um, yes. Yeah, now, it's, it's got to be said that the political system, whether it's right or wrong, is the reason we have an unelected prime minister. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's the reason we have uh, a party which is so completely chaotic, in absolute chaos. It can't even agree with itself and somehow managed to be in power for 13 years. I don't see how that's happened. I mean, it's lost its majority several times. What? What? Why are you still there? You know, this shit be happening yeah. Cheryl uh, says we should have had a new government when Cameron went instead of all these jokers who bled to the country um what do you reckon Darren I mean it, it is a bit broken isn't it? it it's completely broken it's not a bit broken it is completely you agree with Rishi broken Rishi's part of the problem that that that's the issue um Somebody mentioned Suella Braveman a, a second ago, and I know we did her on the show a while ago, but I do feel she's important to come back to um, because I think that it is all connected. Because it's so broken, all they have is to get us looking the other way. Uh, I, I have a thing, and it's slightly off topic, but I think it's really important for our viewers to, to, to have a little think about, and even for us, because we don't like to look inside the media ourselves. But mm. personally, I feel we need a, a really urgent conversation around how much more of Suella Braveman xenophobia we can have broadcast on national television, masquerading as political discourse. Um, I saw one outlet yesterday clipping up something she said with the whole, they'll take our jobs, they don't speak the language. Um, all that rhetoric and, and and the outlet kind of asking, is that right? Now, for me, that's not political discourse. It's the language of racism. It's the language that ordinary people watching this show don't recognise because we live together peacefully. We get on, we expand our horizons, our cultures. It's the kind of thing I'm hearing Suella Braveman come out with, Susie. It's the language I've spoken about previously on the show, and it's the kind of language that leads to kids getting bullied at school for being different, um, people having stuff put, in, put through their letterbox. I remember the case of mm. Fatuma Haidara, uh, where somebody did that, killing her and her two daughters in November last year. It's the kind of language that leads to people like Hubert Brown, who got stabbed earlier this week um, in London. Do you know what do you know what would you can't work? Pump this stuff out, Susie, and then and then court her as 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 our broadcast media do for sit downs where she can do it. To someone and someone crosses the line, and then you say you don't have blood on your hands. I think we have to have an urgent conversation about how much more of this we can have broadcast from our national media outlets and not say enough. Not is she right or what do you think or do you share her. We have to say enough, otherwise we are creating a culture that is going to be febrile, a tinderbox in this country that we thought we last saw in the 70s. It is shameful that we have it again in 2023. Mm. Now, one of the things that might work, perhaps, I was just thinking while you were speaking there, is if um, we use the same laws on Suella Bravman that were introduced for Jerry Adams when he was leader of the IRA and uh, broadcasters weren't allowed to use his voice. Do you remember that back in the mm -hmm. 80s? And so they had to get an actor 
to voice the things that Jerry Adams said. And actually the actor was quite was quite sounded quite nice. And when we finally did hear Jerry Adams' voice, we thought, oh good Lord, he sounds like he's terribly Irish. Uh, and it just sounded very different. Uh, how about if we had an actor voice some of the things that Suella Bragman said? A white actor, of course. I'm telling you, a white person saying the stuff that Suella Bradman had said would sound like a Nazi. They just, and they would they would not be broadcast in the same way. It's because she has brown skin, unfortunately, and it really should be the case. But if we had her voiced by someone who sounded like Alf Garnet or Jasper Carrot, right? Someone with a regional accent who says yeah. some of this stuff, it would just be funny in a way. To some people, it would be satire. It would be laughable. It would be a joke. It would be ridiculous. It wouldn't be something that, like you say, that is taken seriously enough to be discussed on news night as a possible, you know, way of looking at things. Because just because she's home secretary, don't make her bright. It doesn't make her right. And it just, if I think we should just find a way of revoicing her to point out the true nature of what it is that she's saying. Because again, it's being a woman as well. A woman saying stuff sounds different to a man saying things. It's not just about skin color, is it? It's it's about someone saying it in a way that's acceptable because she's a home secretary, because she has brown skin, because she is a woman, she's able to say some of this stuff. Whereas, you know, a white man of your age, Darren. Wouldn't be allowed on the telly yeah. saying that. Good Lord, if you was on question time and you were white and bald with a little grey oh. beard, no way! Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And, you know, a, a colleague of ours, Kevin McGuire, was saying, I heard him saying, you know, and, and it's so great that yourself and Kevin say this. Sometimes when you're white, you find it, it's almost sort of, it's, it's difficult to say it because, my goodness me, I'd be mortified if someone thought I was criticising somebody who knows what they're talking about. No, she doesn't know what she's talking about. She is there to legitimise hate and the policies of the far right. She wants to play to a base within the Tory party that wants to take the country backwards. And I think as far as we are concerned, uh, boss Rishi Sunak, he's going to speak at 11.30 today. He needs to come out and distance himself from that. But of course he won't. Of course he won't. Because this is the man who, when he campaigned for his leadership, referred to his tan, believe it or not. I, I think as far as the, the party is concerned and Suella Braveman is concerned, uh, she's making life difficult for the people we at the Mirror fight for. And uh, I feel that what you summed up just there is so true. If that was somebody who was white, who said it in the office, who said it on question time, who said it on uh, in a social setting, they would be rightly condemned. They would be torn apart. Why is it legitimate for the Home Secretary to be using that kind of language, taking this country backwards, endangering the safety of millions of people and driving a wedge between communities and we are not saying to her enough we must i think we have to otherwise we are in serious serious peril as a country mm. do you know what i think it's almost people are being a bit woke with suella and saying you know she's she's allowed to say all this stuff because she's a woman because she's in an ethnic minority she's allowed to do whatever she likes which is the very work thing that i could have sworn that suella is sort of trying to work against uh now mike says farage dancing oh, this was something else i'm sorry i don't even want to think about this i know we have some footage of it but you know the mirror called this party conference crazed and confused but it's been very messy suella braverman echoed Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech, as we've just been discussing. Then she skewered a guide dog with her stiletto, all right? Uh, uh, Therese Coffey boasted about keeping gun laws relaxed after five people were massacred by someone with a shotgun in Plymouth. What? Uh, and Lee Anderson, the deputy chairman, said, who'd want to go to Bradford anyway, when um, he was asked about HS2. And if you haven't been horrified yet by the footage of Pretty Patel and Nigel Farage dancing and singing at Tory conference to Frankie Valley, then can I recommend that you close your eyes because you will never unsee it. It's fairly horrific stuff. And as Mike was pointing out there, sorry, his comments, oh my word, no, 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 why are we watching this? As Mike was pointing out there, you know, if, if these two are able to laugh and dance with each other, Farage, who was ejected, I think, or resigned from the Conservative Party years ago, the fact that Farage is dancing the night away with senior Tories says it all, says Mike. UKIP have infiltrated, if not taken over, the Tory party. This is, before we move on to good news, Darren, this is kind of the thing, isn't it? When 
UKIP kind of distanced themselves from the Tories because they were just too centrist. They were just too happy to work with Europe. And UKIP sort of went off to the to the to the right. That was that was the right wing of the Conservative Party ejecting itself and forming a little factional group and then threatening the main Conservative Party at elections and things and, of course, getting elected to Europe under proportional representation, which is one of the costs of PR and electoral reform is you get the far right in. Um, and now, post-Brexit, they seem to be coalescing again. And after the next general election, which they're going to lose because Labour is still 20 points ahead, um, the chances are the rump of the Conservative Party that's left is going to be the Farageist, Pretty Patel, Jacob Rees-Mogg, Suella Braverman, led, influenced wing of something nasty. And it's the, it's the nasty, it, the, you know, if Theresa May it thought... Was. I thought it, it used to be nasty. nasty. It's going to get a lot nastier, isn't it? Well, absolutely. But, but you know, I, I almost wonder if this is Project Fear all over again, because we saw uh, with Farage and his connection with the whole Brexit campaign, how he played on the fears of this country to, to be able to get, I don't even want to use the phrase, so I won't, but he managed to succeed, shall we say. And and we're seeing it all over again, playing on the fears of this country. They are embracing him. He had a rapturous reception yesterday. This guy who has never been elected, I think it's seven times of trying. Um, mm. He had a ra rapturous reception. Oh, Darren's gone. Darren's gone. Uh, I Just keep hearing gone. words. There he is, he's back. He had a rapturous yeah. reception, you think, Darren? Sorry, your well, signal's I, I, I use that in relative terms, of course, you know. But, but I think as far as he is concerned, he and those people who embrace him uh, and those figures like Patel, like Rhys Mogg, they're all examples of the fact that if you can articulate well and you wear a nice suit, you can be legitimised, even though you don't have vision, you don't have wisdom, you do lie, and you are proven to be a liar. Um, and But you can manage to get your hands on the seat of power that enables you to have free reign over destroying and dismantling not only various industries around this country, but as well as trying to do freedoms that have been hard won and that's the danger that he and they represent. Mm. And that's why I am, you know, we, we sometimes it's very easy to kind of write them off as a fringe element, a clown car of characters, and I use that word advisedly, uh, that are a little bit of a joke. But there is real danger about the fact that they are managing to hoodwink great swathes of this country into believing their divisive rhetoric and into believing that they have policies that are going to make life better for many people when, in fact, they are going to leave them. Just as we started with the, 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 the veterans who are frustrated and hit a brick wall uh, and all those people suffering from the cost of living crisis and all those people living in poverty and all those people who still haven't had justice for Grenfell and all the other areas of society that have been let down, those people will continue to dance and laugh and quaff champagne while everybody else is left helpless, in some, in many cases, homeless and mm. having to fend for themselves. That's what Sunak and all of those, Sunak, uh, uh, Farage and all of those people represent. Yeah. It does seem that the far right is starting to have a bit of a moment. Um, we'll have to just sort of keep an eye on each other and make sure everyone's okay. Eddie says, 150 Tory MPs made this man Prime Minister. Surely that needs to change. <laughs> uh, I think it's happened with the, uh, Labour as well. I mean, Gordon Brown was um, became Prime Minister without an election. And it's happened repeatedly through our, our past because we vote for a party, not a person. And if we voted for a person, we'd end up with Donald Trump, which is probably not a good idea. Um, but... This is the system we've got, and if you want to say there's something knackered about it, there probably is, but whether Rishi Sunak's the person to fix it, I doubt it.